this is not a phase. This is not something that is casual or or like a like a job that they want when they grow up. This is their life. This is who they are. To say anything else is erasure. It's to say that those people don't exist. Do you understand that those are the stakes for these kids? This isn't a, a color bag that they pick to bring to school. This is not something that they do to rebel against their parents. This is their entire life. Impassioned feelings in the Senate about the bill prohibiting gender affirming surgeries and hormone therapy for minors. SB 140 passed along party lines and now goes to the governor's desk. Good evening. Welcome to Lawmakers on day 37 of the Georgia legislative session. I'm Donna Lowry in Atlanta. More on the bill to limit health care options for transgender youth is coming up. The massive mental health reform bill arguably became the biggest lift by the General Assembly, Assembly affecting Georgians last year. It's one of the most lasting legacies of the late House Speaker David Ralston. This session, the effort continues to try to lift Georgia from near the bottom in rankings on mental health care resources. Tonight, we'll spend much of the show looking at the issues and the new bipartisan bill looking to tackle some of the problems. Joining us in the studio are the co-sponsors of the bill. But first, our Capitol correspondent, Rochelle Ritchie, gives us a rundown of what happened today at the Gold Dome. Well, hi, Donna. The controversial transgender bill, SB 140, was argued again in the Senate and in the House, vaping could become a misdemeanor. The Senate started the day by passing Senate Resolution 334, which will restrict using Senate funds for future travel by members of the Senate about to leave office, as well as Senate staff. As long as I'm privileged to serve in this position, I will work to ensure that taxpayer dollars are used effectively in this chamber and that all funds for travel are tied to a specific legislative purpose. The resolution in response to a trip taken by former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, along with former Senator Pro Tem Butch Miller and a bipartisan delegation of senators and staff on a trade mission to Europe and England. The trip was estimated to have cost over $100,000. It was passed 54 to 0. And the transgender affirming bill made its way back to the Senate after being amended and passed in the House. I want you to tell you how, honestly, how compassionate I feel that we are truly protecting the lives of children by not offering the life-altering drugs and, of course, the surgeries that are completely irreversible. I ask for your favorable consent on Senate Bill 140, and I look forward to, you know, to, to looking people straight in the eye and tell them that I am compassionate to their plea and I understand their passion, but we're doing the right thing by being and protecting children. We are using children as pawns. Um, we are using children uh, to really push push forward work that it's under the guise of compassion, and, and I do believe that the sincerity of some of the members in this room, but broadly speaking, this really is about us bullying children in order to score political points. While SB 140 was in the House, the language that protected doctors from being criminally prosecuted was removed. Not only are doctors now being put at jeopardy, but also our children still stand at risk. I understand the compassion that Senator from the 13th has for our youth. We obviously disagree. Um, our children are at risk when they're not given access to the hormone therapy that they need in order um, to properly manage their gender dysphoria. But the but bill to does not point, say they're criminally liable. Is that yes or no? That is correct. The bill okay, does not you. say right. those words. Remember that if you refer to the bill that we pass out of this body, um, it explicitly says that doctors will not be held civilly or criminally liable. So what the House did was that they stripped that language around, out, so it's now silent. So by not providing immunity to our doctors, what we in effect do is open them up to these types of charges. From an immunity standpoint, that portion was removed and it is silent in there. But physicians were still held civilly liable from a malpractice standpoint. And the question is, is that should we be held as a physician, should we be excused from criminal or civil conduct? And I, I certainly have 
angst or I have challenges related to that, but I think that in the end, I think that from a criminal or civil standpoint, we should never be above the law by any means, and I think that's a very important distinction. Democrats pointed out that Republicans have consistently promoted parental rights in other issues. This is the definition of hypocrisy. The rule does seem to be that we are for parental rights when those parents make decisions we agree with. And when we don't like the decisions they make, then we intend to outlaw those decisions. I've heard that there's some sort of moral and religious imperative to help these children. But if we had that imperative and took it seriously, then there are over 400,000 children in Georgia living in poverty that need our attention. There are over 8,000 children in foster care that need our attention today. There are 60% of children in this state that are not reading on grade level by the third grade that need our attention today. But instead, we spent hours and caucus positions dealing with a bill that does nothing more than put lives of transgender children at risk. In the end, the bill was passed for a third time along party lines, 31 to 21. In the House, SB 47 will now include vaping as a misdemeanor offense for smoking in smoke-free areas. The bill now includes the use of any electronic smoking device which creates an aerosol or vapor. If you can't smoke in an area, you can't vape in an area. And that is what the bill does. The bill passed 152 to 14. Also in the House, SB 218 passed 171 to 0. The bill would ensure that people who have completed a term of incarceration are provided a personal identification card. Some members argue it's necessary for successful reentry into society. We should do everything we can to help them gain employment and other services. And one of the ways we can do this is to provide them a comprehensive packet of uh, all the courses they've completed, like if they've completed a welding course or any educational where they've gotten a GED, and then also um, to give them a, a state-issued uh, ID card and a status update on Georgia banks from the Department of Banking and Finance. There is fear and uncertainty uh, in the market and that's that's really understandable when you see what's playing out and how it's being pre presented in the national press and also um, what I would pr probably term as dangerous speculation on social media. Uh, however, notwithstanding how it's being portrayed in certain circles, the state of banking overall in this country is very strong, and that's especially the case in the state of Georgia. And the session is scheduled to resume on Thursday. That is my Capitol Report. Donna, back to you. Thanks, Rochelle. The Georgia House continues efforts this year to strengthen Georgia's mental health delivery system. With us are the legislators who also worked together on the Mental Health Parity Act last legislative session. Here to talk about House Bill 520 are Republican State Representative Todd Jones of South Forsyth. He is chairman of the House Technology and Infrastructure Inf Innovation Committee. A mouthful and Democratic State Representative Mary Margaret Oliver of Decatur, who has served in the General Assembly for more than 25 years. Yes. Welcome to you both back for, to lawmakers. We had you both on earlier in the session for an update on last year's mental health bill, a championed by the late Speaker David Ralston. And since you were here last, the new House Speaker, John Burns, has pushed to further those efforts. And he talked about it in an interview a few weeks ago. We'll be able to formulate even more plans to address the mental health issues across our state, whether that be in the homeless community, uh, the public safety areas, um, and, and how we, uh, we work with folks who have those issues to make sure we address each and every one of them that are specific to individuals. And I think that's what we have to realize. Mental health issues aren't one size fit all, fits all, if you will, but they're sp specific individuals. And we have to make sure our programs are tailored, that our workforce is available to make sure that we address those issues. 
Now, Speaker Burns, Burns, of course, praised both of you for all your work in all of this. Chairman Jones, you both last year marked said this marked a beginning. Yeah. This wasn't a one and done kind of. Absolutely not. So let's start with with that. What is the the scope of this whole project to lift Georgia when it comes to mental health? Well, I, I think the scope really starts with let's remember the foundation is built with first and foremost just the number of stakeholders. Uh, the commission headed up by. Um, Chairman Tanner, Kevin Tanner, and then also all the subcommittee chairs, which of course Representative Oliver is one of them. So, and then it's the House and it's the Senate working together. And with 1013, we were able to build what we call the foundation, but we see this as the decade of mental health and substance abuse. And the build on that you're seeing from 520 really comes around workforce development that I know Representative Oliver wants to talk about a lot tonight. And I agree with her, it's a huge part of 520. It's about data sharing, making sure that we can get better predictions in terms of how we serve our citizens. Um, it's about making sure that we understand what our infrastructure is to serve mental health and substance abuse around bed studies as just one example. So there's so much folded into 520, but there's also some simplicity to 520 in terms of it has some studies to get us smarter in terms of where we can go and where are some of the places where we where we can use as building blocks. Yeah, so we, we've got to look at this as, as you yeah. have 10 years, a decade of doing this. Uh, he's, he mentioned the commission. Tell us a little bit about that commission. I was very pleased to be appointed to the commission by Speaker Ralston. And this past year, I've chaired the workforce subcommittee. There are five subcommittees. And the product of 1013 that passed in 2022 and 520 that's before us this 2023 all came first from the commission subcommittees. We met all, every month, my subcommittee did, and all of the hearings you could watch online and the report that came out of the Behavioral Health and Innovation Commission is several hundred pages. So that was the foundation in 2022 and gave us a step two in 2023. And then after our report came out, there are other stakeholders that came forward that added provisions. Workforce development is our number one challenge. Yeah, so we're going to get into that a little bit more as we talk today. I, I do want to talk about one of the things you guys mentioned early on uh, when you were when this was announced, and that was definitions. And, and there's been a lot of back and forth about it. Why is that so important, a definition of mental health? Well, I think consistency. Um, when you think about the key definitions that we're thinking about here in 520, we talked about mental illness and what that means to Georgia back in 1013. But when you think about serious mental in, mental illness and then also familiar faces, this is a group of individuals that make up literally half a percent, one percent of the mental health, I'll say, community. But it takes up an exorbitant percentage of our resources. So being able to make sure these familiar faces, they basically go through what I call the three-legged stool. That's homelessness, healthcare, incarceration, and effectively go counterclockwise or clockwise, they're gonna keep on that cycle. So how do we make sure that all of those stakeholders in that ecosystem are using similar, tech, uh, similar uh, vernacular, similar phraseology, making sure that when someone says they have serious mental illness versus mental illness, there's something meaningful about that. And what does that mean in terms of the treatment, the resources that need to be uh, applied to that, and how it is that we can effectively move forward? Okay, I want to uh, break down some of the mental health needs in Georgia during the show, and I'm going to start with adolescents and children. And let's look at some of the stats. In Georgia, suicide is the third leading cause of death among youth ages 10 to 17. Forty-five percent of children ages 3 to 17 struggle to or are not able to access needed health, mental health treatment and counseling. And approximately 70 percent of youth in and the Department of Juvenile Justice, the long-term facilities, have a mental health diagnosis severe enough to require ongoing treatment. Those are startling statistics, I think. They're frightening. Yeah. They're startling. And particularly for the children that are in the state's custody, whether they're the foster care children, nine or 10,000, whether the children in DJJ, but all the children, two million children in Georgia that are act, trying to access mental health services across the largest state east of the Mississippi, 159 counties, many of which have very limited mental health service providers. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about that um, in terms of, I would imagine some of the calls that you have received, you, you've talked about the calls over yeah. this past year, you both sure. received all other lawmakers, are issues involving children, right? Oh, 100%. 
uh, they're probably, <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to say every day, that's, that, that's, that, that's an exaggeration, but a week does not go by when a mother or a father is reaching out to me and saying, my daughter, my son, or in some instances, grandchild, uh, they've been at the ER for three days, for four days, for five days, can you help me find a bed? And I will tell you, so many of our colleagues from both sides of the aisle, I'm able to reach out to them, and we had one, for instance, uh, on the eastern side of the state, and I literally contacted the person, they were at a Georgia football game, and literally wow. stepped away from the Georgia football game on, in the stadium to help me facilitate how it is that we can help. So there's so many of us within the General Assembly who want to help. There's so many at the department who want to help, but there is no doubt. We said it last year. We're going to say it again this year, Donna. If we don't get the easy button like Staples in <clears> terms of where they start, they got to have a start here button, and we got to be able to help every citizen of Georgia understand if they have that challenge, press the button, start here, and give them a path forward. I know a lot of people are happy to hear about that. I want to give some more eye-opening information when it comes to children. Untreated behavioral health illnesses in children and adolescents can lead to drug and alcohol abuse, violent or self-destructive behavior, low educational attainment, and lower rates of employment in adulthood. It just it's it's a continuing cycle. Like if you don't if we don't get a handle on it, we're going to see problems down the road. We don't get a handle on it early and effectively and quickly. We had a difficult hearing yesterday in juvenile justice on children that are coming into the state's defect system as a surprise in one way or another. Why are children surprising us in this way when they've already been in the CHINS program, Children in Need of Services on the juvenile court, or they've been uh, accessing mental health services on the APEX program, which is a new mental health program active in about 750 schools out of our about 2,500 schools. Why should we be surprised when a child has an emergency? We have to be more proactive. We have to preventive of these crises, and we have to be more, uh, ex provide more access for these services that are absolutely essential. And we are, Todd and I, are the legal custodians of 10,000 children, foster care children. We're 100 percent responsible for those children getting access. And we in the General Assembly have to be thinking about that in a very proactive way. Yeah, we've had, uh, we've talked about the hoteling issue on this show. Uh, talked to Commissioner Tanner about that. Some of the, those kids are in those positions because of their, of their problems with mental health issues. Many of them are there because of mental health crisis and service providers have failed them. They've not been able to get adequate access. A few of those children are there as a surprise. We didn't know what to do with them, and that was the only access. So that's, that's an unacceptable option, and we have to do better. Okay. Well, there's so much more to talk about this. So more on the mental health bill coming up. We'll look at things like homelessness, jails, substance abuse, workforce issues when we come back. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy. The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. Here's what's new this month with Passport. Whichever way I turn, there's a trap. Let's set this palace on fire. She's to be married. She is not married yet. It's never a burden to love or give. The mother is at the heart of everything we do. These and all your favorite shows are available with Passport. Support your PBS station and stream more with Passport on the PBS app. Community, learning, working, playing, celebrating. Doing life is always better together. At GPB, we aim to provide you with the tools to be able to do life together well. Our mission to educate, inform, and entertain inspires everything from our wide range of programming to our stimulating radio conversations to our fun in-person events. We've got something for everyone. Visit gpb.org community to learn more about our upcoming events. We care about things that affect the lives of every American. We are there at the front line. 
to get to the heart of what really matters in every issue. This country has not seen this in 80 years. This extraordinary moment in American history. You're making such a huge impact. Trust is at the heart of what we do. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Donna Lowry. We're going to continue our conversation on HB 550, the mental health bill, with the Georgia representatives Mary Margaret Oliver and Todd Jones. The beginning of this 44-page bill deals with housing, and even the name, which is at the beginning of the bill, refers to buildings and housing tenant selections. And Chairman Jones, kind of explain a little bit what that's all about. Well, what it's all about is it's about being able to understand where it is, especially with that serious mental illness population and familiar faces in terms of where it is that we can provide housing. May it be coming out of acute, going in the step down, and then ultimately into some type of assisted living. If you look at the Department of Justice settlement that we did with the state back in 2009, 2010, you'll see that one of the major focuses was to get away from congregate living, which many people just consider group, group living, and get them into the community, in a sense mainline, and have the ability to provide community-based housing. So we are looking at every way, may it be through state, may it be through private-public partnerships, but really trying to see how a critical point is and that's this many of them have felony convictions and many of those felony convictions date back literally 5 10 maybe sometimes 15 years that sometimes gets them not qualified for an apartment how is it that we can work with the private sector to be able to get this population into appropriate housing how is it that we can work with the state in terms of its beds and what is it that and where is it that we need to make our investments in terms of infrastructure we've had this conversation within the house we've had very productive dialogue with the senate and uh, we're hoping to find i think a path forward from a study uh, with commissioner tanner and the department and this includes the unhoused or homeless community. That's Absolutely. a big part of all of this yeah. that people want to see addressed. Um, let's talk about workforce issues now. First, some numbers. When it comes to ac accessing um, behavioral health services in Georgia, of the state's 159 counties, 78, those in orange on the screen, don't have a licensed psychologist. In light blue, the 53 that don't have a licensed social worker. And in dark blue, 45 counties don't have either one, psychologists or social workers. Um, these are the <clears throat> professions we hear about, but that is just a small part of even the workforce issue. We are trying to increase our residency slot for psychiatrists. Some of the allied uh, mental health service providers are, are working with psychiatrists. We also have family therapists and we also have clinical social workers. And all of those folks are part of the service delivery in different license categories. We have a maybe over a 25% vacancy rate in our mental health service providers throughout the CSBs, community service boards across the state. And in the workforce subcommittee that I chaired, we spent an enormous amount of time, how do we bolster this workforce? It's a national problem, but in Georgia it seems to be more critical. We are expanding the loan forgiveness program for those serving in mental health positions in slots that are underserved area. <clears throat> we are taking a deep dive look at the licensing board barriers mm -hmm. for people coming from Alabama, from people coming out of Georgia schools, and for foreign trained uh, mental health professionals. We have a lot of re uh, 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 an antiquated bureaucracy and we're trying to modernize that and improve that. Other states have done a better job, particularly with the foreign trained professionals, to get them in slots. Thirdly, we're working on a program that's been very successful for doctors. We want to offer it to other mental health professionals and nurses, uh, alternative disciplinary process for those practitioners who are having some issue, perhaps substance abuse, perhaps mental illness, that we can provide them from a different path to keep their license, keep working in a very safe and monitored way. We have a lot of good ideas in House Bill 520. Uh, and we have a process in the last three days to bring it home for Georgia citizens. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about and near the end what, what that's all about. Uh, Chairman Jones, the bill also calls for a pilot program to provide funding for the county jails. 
um, when it comes to behavioral health. Talk about that briefly. So when you think about, in a sense, where are some of the entry points into the system? Without a doubt, it's our 159 counties and it's our jails. We don't have 159 jails, but it's definitely our county jails and it's our sheriffs. Our sheriffs take on a huge brunt in terms of not just the assessment piece and the transportation of them into the jails or back to the ER, but sometimes even to um, the, the, the bed in terms of the acute facility. So for us, getting this pilot done, we want to be able to get it done across the entire state in terms of can we get one in the urban area, the suburban area, the exurban area, the rural area, the coastal area, but can we also get high population, low population to get a good understanding in terms of as we have people coming in, just like you spoke about the DJJ, 70%, well, what are we looking at? What is that percentage from a behavioral health standpoint coming into our county jails? And what is it that we could possibly be doing sometimes at the county level, but other times at the department level? Okay. I want us to hear some testimony now uh, from a woman who uh, who spoke before the Senate Health and Human Services Committee on this bill. And she takes antidepressants for depression, but when she changed jobs, her insurance changed, and that became a problem. It takes four to six weeks for an antidepressant to become effective. It also takes several months to come off of an antidepressant. So when you ask a patient that's, in a, that's dealing with depression to change their prescription, you're talking about several months worth of issues, problems, health problems. I missed work and um, it was life affecting. Representative Oliver, you've heard stories like this, right? In 1013, we took the first steps of creating a drug formulary that's required for us to be more consistent in how we're providing prescription help. This changing of prescription is an unnecessary barrier, an unnecessary gap in services. And in 520, we're again addressing it in the final stages. We'll see we're working on language right now. The long-lasting injectable medicine, which is newer and more effective. Uh, why do we have insurance barriers to changing these drug prescriptions? And I hope that some of the language in 520 will address that. Yeah, one, uh, one of the issues that came up during that hearing, and I know you were still there, you had to leave at, at some point, yeah. was the, the feeling that this is increasing government, that this bill, how do you guys answer that? There's a small percentage of the population that are just against government. They don't like big government, they don't like any government, and they're active and they're vocal about why we don't need more government. But the majority of the folks in the General Assembly, and more importantly, the majority of my constituents, know that these services are essential for us to have a functioning society, that there are families in crisis, and we have to use our tax money better to deliver these service in a more efficient way. Mm -hmm. But we're consistently hearing those small vo those voices that are a small percentage that says we don't want more government. Yeah, but your answer on that. Well, I think there's no doubt there's going to be a balance, and I tend to come from a conservative viewpoint, so there's going to be a balance in terms of limited government and what is it that we have to deliver as a government versus what is it that we can just have personal accountability for. There's no doubt that balance will always be there. I think 520 is trying to strike that balance, especially when we factor in the DOJ settlement that the state entered into. That is a contract that I think any conservative would say private contracts are things that we need to honor. That is something that the state has to move toward and has to achieve the milestones within there. I think the department underneath the leadership of Kevin Tanner is going to do a very good job in leading us there and we're going to be meeting with the federal government I know in the summer but at this point I understand completely we want to be able to limit but at the same time be able to deliver what we need to in order to have a functioning society 10.7 million Georgians being served and at the same time meet the requirements of the settlement yeah uh, right now the you know the, the house overwhelmingly passed it it's in the Senate what were the next steps We've had one hearing in the Senate, and tomorrow the Senate uh, committee that has this bill will meet. We believe they'll come forward with a substitute. There'll be changes that they'll make to 520. We're in discussions with them, and we'll be in discussions with them for the last three days of the session pretty intensely, I think. And I'm, I'm confident we'll have a good bill. Will this go down the sine die? We hope it doesn't go down a sine die, but we understand the esprit de corps between the two chambers, and uh, we're looking forward to working with the Senate. Yeah, so it, it, there was, there's still a lot to work through both sides of this. But, Absolutely. But there's a movement, and I think you guys feel pretty good about that. I feel good, and the work ethic is we're here to work, and I 
It'll be day 39, maybe not day 40. Okay, we'll see how it goes. Well, I want to thank you on behalf of all Georgians for all the work that you, you guys have been doing on all of this. I know it's a lot of hard work, and you're, you're hearing a lot of negative stuff. Well, I wouldn't say a lot. No, a few I'm... people, a few people are with negativity, but most people are very happy that you guys are doing this, so thank you. Thank you. Well, that does it today for lawmakers. Tomorrow is a committee work day, so the General Assembly does not gavel in, and we'll, we're not here when they're not in. <laughs> We'll be back on Thursday for Legislative Day 38. Have a good night.